Hello everyone, my name is Vladimir and welcome back to the Architecture Weekly YouTube channel. Today I'm continuing this series of architecture readings and today it's time for a second chapter of Database Internals book by Alex Petrov. And today we're talking about uh, binary search trees and B trees and we'll try to understand how the databases use those structures to store the data. Let's go. Imagine we have an array, a really long array with millions and millions of items. And we want to find a particular item in this array. In order to do this, even with a sorted array, we need millions of jumps, which will take times like hundreds of milliseconds. And if we do those operations many times in our program, then it will cost us the performance of uh, our software. In order to avoid that, we need something better, some other data structures that will be more efficient. And the computer science came up with a structure called binary search tree. It looks like this. So we have some values and we have the pointers from one values to another. Let's take a closer look. So here, a very simple binary search tree. It has a root node and it has some value. In this particular case, it's five. On the left-hand side, we have the left subtree with the value of two, and it is less than the value of its parent or root node, which is five. And then we have a right subtree with a single node, which value is greater than the value of the root node. So for this particular video, I will depict the left subtrees with red color, and the right subtree is with blue or violet color. One of the characteristics of the binary search tree is a number of nodes. So here you can see the example of the tree with 11 nodes and all of them count. Okay, so what's about searching for a particular number in this tree? Let's take a look. So here in the bottom, you can see that in order to find a value of 27 in a sorted array of 16 elements, we need to take 10 steps. In contrary, in a binary search tree, we only need four steps and uh, four comparisons in order to find our element. Thus, the binary search tree is much more efficient in terms of searching for a value, hence the name. So if we take this formally, then the search complexity of uh, finding an element in a binary search tree will be uh, the logarithm with a base of two. So logarithm of 16 uh, with a base of 2 is 4, and this is exact the number of steps that we took to find our element in the previous example. However, it works only with balanced trees. And in order to understand what are balanced and unbalanced trees, let's take a look at the picture. So here in the, red, in the green, you see the examples of balanced trees, and they look like balanced, you know, uh, the left or right part uh, does not look uh, too heavy for us. But uh, with the examples on the right hand side, we can see that left node, left subtrees or right subtrees are much heavier than, than the, their counterparts. And actually there is a formal definition of a balanced tree. So uh, the first rule is that uh, the difference between left and right subtree for any node is not greater than one. And if we apply this rule to every, every subtree, then we will get uh, another two rules, like the left subtree is balanced and the right subtree is balanced. Here you can see the example of a balanced tree. The left subtree has uh, the height of two, the right subtree has a height of one, the difference is one, and uh, the subtrees of those trees are balanced as well. The, the, they have difference of zero. So this tree is balanced. But what about absolutely unbalanced trees? So we call them pathological trees because they are not trees anymore. They are a sorted array and they behave very poorly. In order to fix the performance of uh, pathological trees and avoid them in the first place, the binary search trees apply the algorithm called rebalancing. In order to rebalance uh, a pathological tree, 
we find an element in the middle of this tree and we pick it up as a pivot item. Then we rotate the tree around this pivot. So this pivot item becomes this pivot item becomes a new root node, and then we have a tree. We have a left subtree with the elements that are less than our pivot item, and the right subtree has the values greater than our pivot item. How we can describe binary search trees formally? So we can have two parameters. First one is the fan out, and the second is the height of the tree. Height is essentially the number of items in the longest subtree. And here we have the binary search tree with a height, uh, with a height of four. The fan out is the number of connections between one node and another node. For the binary search tree, it's two because it's a binary tree, right? Here you can say, hey, binary search trees are in memory structures, right? How are we gonna use them to store anything on the disk drive? And before we continue, we need to speak about the organizations of storing data on uh, hard disk drives and uh, solid state disk drives. And with hard disk drives, they have, you know, this spinning head that uh, need to go all over the disk to find information right there and, and so on. Those disks are pretty slow. The solid state disk drives are much more efficient because uh, they don't need this spinning head and they can access particular pages or blocks on the disks independently. Let's take a closer look. Here you can see an example of uh, the organization of data on a solid state disk drive. There are pages there and pages are small spaces where uh, the data can be written. Pages are organized inside blocks and the typical block uh, has from 64 to 500 12 pages. The blocks themselves are organized inside planes and the planes are organized in dies. The nuance and an important one is uh, that we only can write the data by blocks. So we, co we cannot access uh, a particular page from a block, but in order to erase the block or modify a particular page, we need to read the whole block, then modify the information and write the whole block down. So this is the reason why those blocks are also called write blocks. Binary search trees as data structures are pretty inefficient with this limitation of having writing blocks. So computer science came up with a better structure called a B tree, which works much, much better with solid state disk drives. We can depict the binary search tree node as the following. Instead of, uh, you know, a circle with a value and errors, we can have a rectangle and we will have the value there. And then we'll have a couple of other rectangles with the, with the connections to the left subtree and the right subtree. However, if we increase the fan out of this tree, we will have, uh, for example, a two to three tree node. So it will have two value nodes and three connection nodes. So like left, right, and center. If we continue this extrapolation, we will have a B tree node, which doesn't have like uh, only a single value or a couple of values. And it doesn't have like uh, two connections or three connections to other nodes, but it has, let's say several ones. So it has, it can have like 1000 connections to other uh, other nodes, or let's say 100 values in uh, each node. How's the B3 hierarchy looks like? So in B3, we split all the nodes into three groups. So first group has a single root node. This is the beginning of the tree, the same as uh, binary search trees. The next levels are internal nodes and they don't store the information themselves, they store the keys of other nodes. And the last level are the leaf nodes and they actually store the data. Let's consider an example. So here we see an internal node, right? So it, uh, it has keys Q1, 
key 1, key 2 and key 3, but they are not sequential. Down below in this node we have a reference uh, to other nodes and those nodes will store the keys in the following manner. So the first pointer of the node will point us to the node that holds the keys uh, which are less than the key 1. The second one will store the keys uh, which are greater than the key 1 but less than key 2. And the last one will store the keys that are greater than key 3. With this setup we can build an entire tree covering all the information and all the keys that we want to store and we can scale this data structure across the whole disk. Remember I spoke about the height of the tree, the fan out and they are linked to the efficiency of the data structure. Let's find out if B3 is better for us and how it depends on the fan out. Fan out and height are actually connected and it's logical. The bigger the fan out you have, the less the height, right? And uh, the bigger the k, uh, this fan out value, uh, the more efficient this tree becomes. Let's take a look uh, uh, on the search of complexity. In the binary search tree, we had the complexity of a search as a logarithm base 2 of a number of nodes. And here we have the similar value. So here we have a logarithm based key out of the number of, uh, of m, of number of uh, values in all our tree. So for example, uh, if we have a, binary, a B tree with, uh, with a fan out of 5 and we have 625 elements there, then the search complexity of uh, this tree is only 4. And uh, if we have a really small tree, uh, with the fun out of 4 and uh, 16 elements, then the complexity will be only 2. So that's great. But the question is how many keys we can store in a single node? Let's find this out. And here the structure that uh, the solid state disk drives are using really kicks in. The amount of uh, elements in a single node uh, is called a minimum degree and is depicted with a T letter. And actually, the T is the number of elements that we can fit into a single block. Remember? Right block. Okay, now we know about right blocks, we know about uh, B3, and we know about uh, the minimum degree to which we can write the data to solid state disk drive. Then, having all those parameters, what are the properties of B3s and how we need to use them in order to efficiently store, write and delete the data. B3 properties are the following. So first of all, the root node can hold up up to T minus one keys. So the minimum amount is one, but the maximum is T minus one. All the other nodes except the root can hold from T minus one to two times T minus one keys. And all keys in a single node should be sorted for search efficiency and sorted uh, ascending. Inserting of a node happens at a leaf level only. Hey, you said inserting, but how inserting, merging and uh, splitting the nodes work? Imagine we have uh, an internal node and uh, the keys for them are like K1000, K2000 and K3000. And we have a subnode uh, with keys from 1 to k1000. Then we want to add a new element there. What B3s do uh, in this uh, kind of situations, they split the node into two and copy the half of the values from one node to another. So if we add a new key like 1001, then we need to split this uh, subnode into two two nodes. One will hold the keys from 1 to 500 and another one will hold the keys from 501 to 1001. And of course we need a new pointer to this node. So this pointer is getting inserted into a parent node. In this situation we're calling this key as being promoted to upper node. 
Of course, uh, this can be a recursive uh, process because uh, if we're adding a new value to the parent node, we can overflow her as well. And then we need to add another item to a more parent node, right? And thus we can propagate the change up until the root. And uh, yeah, you can see this uh, on the picture. And the question is here is what happens if the root node overflows as well? Then uh, we extract this, uh, this key, this medium point uh, of the node, and we introduce a new root. So here the old root is becoming an, inter an internal node. We have a new root node and we have uh, a, new, a new sibling to the new internal node and B3 grows vertically. Okay. What about the removing items and non-merge? So if you remove the item from the node and keep uh, removing uh, the values from the node, then its capacity can become less than this two times t thing and uh, become even less than t minus one thing. Then we need to merge this node to another node. And the algorithm is, has three steps as well as a merging one. So first of all, we copy items from the, uh, from the right node to the left node. Sorry for, for mistake here. Then we remove the right node from pointer from the parent, and then we remove the right node. And if we need to repeat this process, then we just propagate the changes up to the root node. And that's it for today. Thank you very much for your attention. If you like the content, please make sure to subscribe and press the bell to get notified about the new videos. And if you really, really, really liked my work, uh, in the description, there are a couple of links to Patreon and Boosty, and you can support my work. I will know that this content is really interesting and will continue with more enthusiasm. Thank you very much. See you next week.